can one know that through which everything is known? How can one know the knower? Namaste. So this Panchadashi is the work of Vidyaranya. Huh? Vidya means verbal knowledge, learning, especially scriptural learning. And Aranya means forest or in the forest. So in the Vedic days, the truths of the Upanishads were only given in the forest to the sannyasis. They were not given to the general public or even the brahmanas who were engaged in temple worship and so on like that because they were in duality. Only those who were qualified were given the knowledge of Advaita. And this was for two reasons. One is that to give the knowledge of Advaita prematurely can result in distortion of the teachings and failure to realize the truth. So the uh, knowledge that's given in the forest is the knowledge of Advaita. And this is the subject of the Panchadashi. The aims of Panchadashi are to expound the truths of Vedanta on the triple basis of scripture, reasoning, and experience. In other words, it's not enough to simply read the scripture, nor to base arguments and dialogues and discussions on the scripture. One must have the experience, and that experience requires concentrated, silent, uninterrupted meditation for a long time until the fruit of the meditation, the fruit of the teaching can manifest. And that is only possible in the forest. To teach the supreme truth in an easily understandable way to those whose hearts have been purified through worship of the lotus feet of the guru. Not just to anybody, but to qualified people alone. Now, I already went over the reasons for this, but this is explicitly stated in the introduction. To provide guidance to the aspirant through instruction and to bring the aspirants to the plenary experience, enlightenment, or self-realization. This word, plenary, means full, complete, or all-encompassing. So the experience of being Brahman is the sine qua non of self-realization. And this is what the aspirant experiences when they get the fruit of their meditation. That is the aim of Sri Panchadashi. Now the structure of Panchadashi is divided into quintads. The first quintad's topic is Sat, chapters 1 through 5, and the content is discrimination of the real, Brahman, from the unreal, matter. The second quintad's topic is Chit, and its chapters are 6 through 10, the nature of the self as pure consciousness. The third quintad is all about Ananda. It covers the 11th through 15th chapter, and it describes the bliss nature of Brahman. So the methods used to attain enlightenment are first, the basic skill of the disciple is discrimination of the real from the unreal. The real means that which is permanent, unchanging, unary, and always the same, without parts, absolute, and eternal. The unreal is that which is temporary, unsatisfactory, not self, conditioned, ignorant, and always changing, 
made up of many parts and so on. In other words, the material world. We have to develop the discrimination to tell one from another, to tell Brahman apart from the world. This is developed by analysis of the three states of experience, waking, dream, and deep sleep. We've been over the states of consciousness in many previous series, but this series will go deeply into the differences and similarities of these three states and how they differ from the absolute consciousness. The investigation into the five koshas, or sheaths, that cover the self, and analysis of the elements or states of matter, earth, solid matter, water, liquid, air, gaseous, fire, plasma, and space. A plasma is an ionized gas. In other words, it has its outer shell of electrons stripped off and has an electrical charge. If you doubt this, take any flame, a candle flame will do, and put a strong magnet near it, and you will see that the magnet affects the flame. That's because the gas in the flame is ionized and therefore subject to electromagnetic fields. Then Panchadashi describes the nature of the self. The self is of the nature of pure consciousness. It is unfailing light, ever-present awareness. The self neither rises nor sets. It is non-dual self-luminous intelligence. The immutable self is the witness consciousness, unchanging, flawless, and eternal. Witness consciousness manifests all things, egoity, intellect, and objects, and continues to shine even when they are non-existent, for example, during deep sleep. People uh, commonly say, well, I was unconscious during deep sleep. No, you're conscious but there are no objects. The world, the senses, the mind, the ego, all that go away, and there is only consciousness. Now, this is sushupti, and this is also the state of deep meditation in samadhi. The nature of the self is that the variegated world appears on consciousness, the immutable self, just as a painting appears on a canvas. Consciousness cannot be negated because it can never experience its own non-existence. Therefore, it is eternal and indestructible. It's inconceivable to even think that I would not exist. And we see that all creatures protect their existence. They defend their body and so on because they do not want to be non-existent even if they identify themselves with the body. But on the level of consciousness, it's impossible to even conceive. The self is not only existence and consciousness, it is also bliss, the supreme value. The self is the seat of supreme love. Everything becomes dear, not for its own sake, but for the sake of the self. There are three notions of selfhood. The principal self is the unconditioned, non-dual reality, the very essence of bliss or love, the selfhood of the son in relation to the parent or vice versa, is secondary selfhood, and identification of the self with the body, etc., is illusory selfhood. The self, in any conception, is the center and seat of love. Everyone loves their own self, and they love their self more than anything or anyone else. Therefore, the self, we can understand, is not only the subject, but also the object of love. And a long time ago, we did a series on Ananya Bhakti, which is devotional love of oneself. Existence, consciousness, and bliss are not parts of Brahman or its attributes. They constitute its svarup, essential nature. 
They are not separate. Existence is consciousness, and consciousness is bliss. Brahman is partless. Brahman is said to be existence, consciousness, and bliss to distinguish it from the world. Because the world of plurality is characterized by impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, and not-self, otherness. There is no other reality similar or dissimilar to Brahman. It has no internal differentiations. Brahman is one. The world is many. This is the principal distinction between them. Brahman has no parts. But everything in the world is made up of parts. It is an assembly. It is not one. So this is the primary distinction we have to keep in mind when discriminating the self, or Brahman, from matter. Now let's talk about Maya. How does the unary reality appear as Jaga, the world of plurality? This is Maya. The world of plurality appears in Brahman, even as a snake appears in a rope. Maya can be understood in three ways. Shrauta, by revealed experience or scriptures. Yauktika, by knowledge and reasoning. And Laukika, by the ordinary view of the world. In Shrauta view, Maya appears unreal. In Yauktika view, Maya appears indeterminate. In Laukika view, Maya appears real. But there is no use asking questions about Maya. The more we question, the deeper the mystery becomes. Maya is that which makes apparently possible what is inherently impossible. Wonder is Maya's garment. Inscrutable is her nature. We cannot solve the mystery of Maya by asking questions. Instead, we should endeavor to transcend Maya. And in this endeavor, the empirical world can be a help instead of an obstacle. Now let's talk about the jiva. The jiva, one who is born, is the empirical individual. The jiva is the non-dual self appearing in a limited or conditioned form on account of nescience. Being endowed with upadis, limiting adjuncts such as egoity, body, etc., it transmigrates from one physical body to another according to its karma. When it gains perfection through spiritual disciplines, it realizes its non-difference from the self. Finally, moksha. The direct means to moksha or liberation is jnana, the path of realized knowledge. Moksha is the very nature of the self. It is not an experience brought about through works. Nescience or ignorance blocks realization of moksha. What removes ignorance is knowledge alone. The path of knowledge consists of shravana, hearing and study, manana, reflection, and nididhyasana, or meditation. So this, in a nutshell, is the contents of Sri Panchadashi. And we will be getting into the first chapter in the next few episodes, which deal with the nature of the self. Aung Tat Sat, Aung Shakti Aung, Aung Namah Shivaya.